be used to risk stratify patients with fewer seminomas. So the beta-HCG is the most commonly elevated serum tumor marker in testicular cancers. Um, elevated serum concentrations of beta-HCG may be present with both seminomatous and non-seminomatous tumors. Um, it is noted that um, patients with post orchectomy beta HCG levels of more than 5,000 IU per liter should receive a brain, um, undergo a brain MRI since they are at increased risk of having brain metastasis. Um, this um, rule of um, beta HCG levels of more than 5,000 IU per liter um, applies to most um, uh, staging workups in testicular cancers. Um, elevated beta-HCG has also been reported in other tumors. So it is important to remember that, um, um, such as lymphoma, bladder cancer, and adenocarcinomas. And further workup should be considered before initiating treatment for mildly elevated beta-HCG. Um, since um, other factors, such as uh, marijuana intake, hyperthyroidism, and hypogonadism can cause elevations of beta-HCG. So elevated serum AFP is not associated with pure seminoma. Um, they are particularly associated with yolk sac tumors, but can also be produced by embryo carcinomas and teratomas. It is important to know that the diagnosis of a seminoma is restricted to pure seminoma histology and a normal serum AFP levels. So other tumors, such as hepatocellular carcinomas and gastric carcinomas, can also cause AFP elevations. Um, if an elevation of serum AFP is due to a metastatic non-seminomatous germ cell tumor, then the AFP typically will be steadily rising. So generally, decisions to treat uh, should not be based solely on AFP values. So um, clinical presentation of patients with testicular ca cancers, um, they would usually present with a painless or painful testicular nodule, mass, enlargement, or an induration. So often patients would present with um, testicular discomfort or swelling suggestive of epididymitis or orchitis. A trial of antibiotics is never warranted in a man with a man a mass suspicious for GCT, but can be considered in men with um, pain without a mass on further workup. So other patients uh, may present with enlarged lymph nodes of the lower neck or upper chest, uh, retroperitoneal mass, yanocomastia, venous thrombosis, or pulmonary embolism. So for the workup, um, we usually do a transcotal ultrasound with doctor. It confirms the presence of a testicular. It determines whether the testicular is testicular, and it explores the contralateral testicular. Um, so germ cell tumors are typically heterogeneous echoic and vascular or an ultrasound and serum markers um, need to be assessed as they are used for prognosis and staging. So transcrotal biopsies of the testes the risk of local or atypical regional recurrences and can complicate management. So elevated levels of the serum tumor marker should be followed up with repeated tests to allow for precise staging. So to assess for metastatic disease, Imaging studies of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis should also be performed. Um, a PET scans should not be used to stage testicular GCTs, and in select patients, brain MRI should also be performed. Again, in serum beta HCG of more than 5,000 IU per liter or extensive lung metastasis. Uh, radical uh, inguinal orchiectomy is usually the primary treatment for most patients who present with it its testicular mass that is concerning for malignancy on ultrasound. So for staging, um, the eighth edition of the AJCC Cancer Staging Manual um, introduced the invasion of the epididymis and hilar soft tissue as a new pathologic criteria as compared to the seventh edition, used for T classification of stage one testicular GCTs. So it can be seen at the P, uh, pathologic T2. So the AGCC TNM staging system incorporates the serum um, tumor marker elevation as a distinct category, you know, S, which is unique to this organ site. So we have S0 to S3. So 
um, guidelines recommend managing patients with stage 1 non-seminoma based um, on the presence or absence of lymphovascular invasion, um, invasion of the spermatic cord or invasion of the scrotum, which are risk factors known to be associated with um, an increased risk of relapse. So stage 1 non-seminoma patients with a high volume of em um, embryonal carcinoma and no evidence of lymphovascular invasion are neither high risk nor, no, nor low risk and could be considered for adjuvant therapy. So for pure seminomas, um, ab abdominal or pe and pelvic CT scan with contrast should be performed to assess the retroperitoneal lymph nodes for staging. Um, chest X-ray can be done or chest CT if with evidence of metastatic disease. So again, measurement of serum tumor markers should be repeated since TNM staging is based on marker levels at the time the patient starts the post orchiectomy therapy. Um, elevated levels should be followed with repeated measurements to allow for precise staging. And declining markers should be followed until normalization or plateau. So sperm banking should also be recommended if clinically indicated um, to patients who will be undergoing adjuvant therapy. So for pure seminoma stage 1A and 1B, uh, most, most of them are cured by orchiectomy alone. So the NCCN panel strongly prefer, uh, prefers surveillance as the standard post-orchiectomy management option for these patients. However, since 15 to 20% of patients on surveillance will experience relapse, the panel recommends chemotherapy with one or two cycles of single-agent carboplatin or radiotherapy with a total of 25 20 to, or 25.5 grays to decrease the risk of relapse in certain patients. Nevertheless, disease-specific survival for stage 1 disease approaches 100% irrespective of the management strategy used. So since most uh, patients with stage 1 pure seminoma are cured by orchectomy alone, um, they the panel strongly prefers surveillance as the standard post orchectomy management option for these patients. Um, again, the C-specific survival for stage 1 disease approaches 100% irrespective of the management strategy used. Um, studies concluded that a single dose of carboplatin is less toxic and as effective in preventing disease relapse as adjuvant RT in men with stage 1 pure seminoma after orchectomy. However, it should be noted that there are limited long-term follow-up data regarding the toxicity and efficacy of carboplatin. So follow-up for patients with stage 1 seminoma managed with active surveillance after orchectomy includes a history and physical examination with optional measurement of um, serum tumor markers performed every 3 to 6 months for the first year, every 6 months for year 2, every 6 to 12 months for year 3, and annually for years 4 and 5. So the measurement of serum tumor markers is optional due to the rarity of marker-only relapse. So the panel also recommends an abdominal pelvic CT scan with or without contrast at 3, 6, and 12 months during the first year, every 6 months for year 2, every 6 to 12 months for year 3, and then every 12 to 24 months for years 4 and 5. CT is not recommended beyond five years unless clinically indicated. Um, so follow-up of um, patients treated with adjuvant therapy, um, chemotherapy or RT, includes a history and PE with optimal measurement, optional measurement um, of post-orchectomy serum tumor markers performed every six to 12 months for the first two years and annually for years three, four, and five. Again, CT is not recommended beyond five years unless clinically indicated. So um, as you can see, uh, mas strict yung um, surveillance kapag uh, mas strict yung follow up pag active surveillance yung ginawa post orchectomy as uh, compared to adjuvant treatment. So stage um, one S pure seminoma is very uncommon and requires persistent elevation of serum tumor markers following orchectomy. Elevated tumor markers increase the risk of disease outside the retroperitoneum. Therefore, systemic therapy should be encouraged. Uh, persistent elevation of serum markers is usually um, evident of metastatic disease, which will show up radiographically if um, doubt exists in the diagnosis. 
So the NCCN panel recommends repeating measurements of serum tumor markers and performing imaging studies to scan for evaluable disease. So um, stage 2A, uh, pure seminoma, is defined as metastatic disease to lymph nodes um, with a lymph node mass measuring less than or equal to 2 cm in the greatest diameter. Um, a lymph node mass measuring 2 to 5 cm in greatest diameter is then classified as stage 2B disease. So the guidelines recommend RT or chemotherapy with three cycles of bleomycin, etoposide, and cisplatin, or four cycles of etoposide and cisplatin. So after primary treatment with chemotherapy, uh, patients with stage 2A, 2B, 2C, or 3 seminoma should be evaluated by a CT scan with contrast of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, as well as measurement of serum tumor markers. Patients with normal serum AFP and beta-HCG levels and either no residual mass or a residual mass equal or less than 3 cm should undergo surveillance. Surveillance is also recommended for patients with a residual mass more than 3 cm and normal serum AFP and beta-HCG levels. Additionally, a PET CT scan from skull base to mid-thigh can be considered to better delineate the presence of viable residual tumor, since CT alone cannot discriminate between residual neoplastic lesions, and necrotic or fibrotic tissue. So for follow-up, um, the recommended follow-up schedule for patients with stage 2A and stage 2B seminomas after art, a history and PE with optional measurement of serum tumor markers every three months for year one, and then every six months for years two through five. So ab an abdominal pelvic CT scan um, with contrast, it's recommended at three months and six to 12 months for year one, annually for years two and three, and then as clinically indicated for the following years. So chest x-ray is recommended every six months for the first two years only. So patients with um, stage 2C or stage 3 seminomas are classified as either good or intermediate risk. Um, intermediate risk in seminoma is based on metastasis to organs other than the lungs. So all stage 2C and stage 3 seminomas are considered good risk, except for stage 3C disease, which involves non-pulmonary visceral metastasis, like the bone, liver, or brain, and is considered intermediate risk. So standard primary chemotherapy is used for both groups of patients. However, three cycles of um, BEP or four cycles of EP are recommended for patients with good risk disease while more intensive chemotherapy with four cycles of BEP or four cycles of VIP, um, etoposide, uh, mesna, ifosomide, and cisplatin is required for, are recommended for patients with intermediate risk disease. So follow-up is the same as post-chemo primary treatment for stage 2A and 2B. So for follow-up, the recommended follow-up schedule uh, for patients with um, stage 2C or stage 3 seminoma after treatment with chemotherapy includes a history and PE as well as measurement of tumor markers every two months for year one, every three months for year two, every six months for years three and four, and one during year five. So abdominal pelvic CT scans with contrast are recommended every four months for year one every six months for year two and annually for years three and four. And then as clinically indicated, so chest x-ray is recommended every two months for year one, every three months for year two and annually for years three to five. So um, non-seminomatous germ cell tumors um, include um, non-seminoma tumors, mixed seminoma and non-seminoma tumors, and seminoma tumors in patients with Elevated serum AFP levels. So kung normal yun, AFP levels mo, seminoma lang siya. Pero pa nag-increase yung serum AFP, most likely may non-seminomatous component. And it is treated then as a non-seminoma GCT. So to assess for metastatic disease, um, CT scans of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis should be performed. And use of PET CT scan um, is not clinically indicated for non-seminoma. So in select patients, again, brain MRI should also be performed. Um, repeated measurements of serum tumor markers is important because TNM staging is based on post-orchectomy values.
So primary treatments for non-seminoma um, non stage 1 without risk factors are surveillance, which is the most preferred, um, nerve sparing, radical pelvic lymph node dissection, or chemo with BEP for one cycle. So the risk factors, na yan, um, they include lymphovascular invasion or invasion of spermatic cord or scrotum. So some centers can um, also consider predominance of embryonal carcinoma as an additional risk factor for relapse. So the long-term follow-up for um, stage 1 non-seminoma patients without risk factors includes history and PE, serum tumor marker assessment, abdominal pelvic CT scan, and chest x-ray. It should be noted that routine chest x-ray may have limited value for detecting relapse in stage 1 non-seminoma patients. The current schedule for routine chest x-ray in the follow-up of stage 1 non-seminoma patients without risk factors is two chest x-rays in year 1 and one chest x-ray in years two through five in patients managed by surveillance. So um, for the post-surgical management, um, it is as follows for non-seminomas, non stage one. So if the resected lymph nodes are negative for malignancy after nerve sparing um, radical pelvic lymph node dissection, the patient should undergo surveillance. For positive lymph nodes, uh, which is uh, N1 to N3, the decision whether to use adjuvant chemotherapy is based on the degree of nodal involvement. Surveillance is the preferred option for patients with um, N1 disease, while chemotherapy is the preferred option for patients with N2 disease. However, chemotherapy is the only option for patients with N3 disease. So recommended chemotherapy regimens include two cycles of either ET which is preferred, or BEP for patients with N1 or N2 disease, and three cycles of BEP or four cycles of EP for patients with N3 disease. So the survival rates for stage 1 non-seminoma managed with surveillance, nerve sparing um, radical pelvic lymph node dissection, or one cycle of BEP chemotherapy exceed 98%. Um, however, the high survival rate associated with surveillance depends on adherence to periodic follow-up examinations and subsequent chemotherapy for the 20 to 30 percent of patients who relapse. Therefore, patients who choose surveillance should adhere to the follow-up schedule. So um, the major difference in the management of um, non-seminoma stage 1 without and with risk factors is that surveillance is preferred for patients with um, stage 1 non-seminoma without risk factors, whereas all three management options should be carefully considered when risk factors are present. So surveillance is also a recommended primary treatment option for stage 1 non-seminoma patients with risk factors. However, it should be noted that lymphovascular invasion is a significant predictor of relapse when orchectomy is followed by surveillance alone. So um, the follow-up difference lies in active surveillance where non-seminomatous germ cell tumor stage 1 with risk factors adheres to a stricter follow-up schedule. The relapse rate at 5 years was 3.2% for patients with lymphovascular invasion and 1.6% for patients without lymphovascular invasion although five-year overall survival was still 100% in both groups. So um, patients um, with stage 1S non-seminoma exhibit persistent elevation of serum, but with no radiographic evidence of disease. However, mildly elevated levels of AFP or beta-HCG after orchectomy must be interpreted with caution. Um, Mildly elevated non-rising AFP levels may not indicate the presence of a GCT and should not be used to guide treatment decisions. And again, um, significant elevations of beta-HCG can be uh, detected in patients with hyperthyroidism um, using marijuana and hypogonadism. So the vast majority of stage 1S patients have serum tumor markers in the S1 range and they should receive primary chemotherapy for good risk disease, either three cycles of BEP or four cycles of EP. Both are preferred, and both regimens are category one recommendations. And either is preferable to initial um, radical pelvic lymph node dissection as these patients nearly always have disseminated disease. 
So um, for non-seminoma non stage 2A, um, primary treatment um, for patients with stage 2A depends on post-orchectomy serum tumor marker levels. For patients with normal post-orchectomy levels of AFP and beta-ACG, the NCCN panel recommends either nerve sparing, RP, LND, or chemotherapy with three cycles of BEP or four cycles of EP as primary treatment options. For stage 2A patients with persistently elevated AFP or beta-HCG levels, um, again, they recommend primary chemotherapy with three cycles of BEP or four cycles of EP. So um, if chemotherapy is given, EP is the preferred regimen in this setting. The risk of relapse in clinical stage 2A, non-seminoma patients with um, N2 or N3 disease after radical pelvic lymph node dissection is more than 50%. This risk is reduced to less than 1% um, with two cycles of adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy. So you more than 50% the risk turns to less than 1% with adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy. So therefore, the NCCN panel prefers two cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy with EP or BEP to surveillance for N2 disease and recommends full course chemotherapy for P, um, N3 disease. So subsequent management after primary chemotherapy depends on the size of the residual mass on CT scan. So for post-surgical um, RPLND, management and follow-up is directed depending on nodal disease, as was described earlier during discussion of the stage one. So for the stage 2B, um, primary treatment depends on post-orchectomy levels, uh, tumor marker levels, and radiographic findings. When tumor marker levels are normal, the CT findings determine the proper course of treatment. If abnormal radiographic findings are limited to lymph node metastasis within lymphatic drainage sites in the retroperitoneum, the patients may receive primary chemotherapy um, mm -hmm. with either three cycles of BEP or four cycles of EP or primary nerve sparing um, RPLND. If metastatic disease is not confined um, within the lymphatic drainage sites, primary chemotherapy is recommended. For stage 2B, non-seminoma patients with persistent marker elevation, the recommended treatment option is also primary chemotherapy. So post-chemo and post-surgical management and follow-up is the same as for stage 2A. So the primary chemotherapy options for patients with advanced metastatic non-seminoma are based on categorization as good, intermediate, or poor risk, based on identification of clinically independent prognostic features, such as extent of disease and post-orchectomy levels of serum tumor markers. For good risk patients, three cycles of BEP or four cycles of EP are advised. Both regimens are well tolerated and cure approximately 90% of patients. For patients with intermediate risk disease, the cure rate is approximately 70% with a standard chemotherapy regimen of four cycles of BEP. Poor risk patients undergo four cycles of BEP or VIP with fewer than 50% having complete response and 30% noted to be dying of their disease. So if a complete response to chemotherapy is found by radiographic imaging, and the tumor marker levels are normal, the NCCN panel recommends surveillance, but RPLND can be considered in patients with retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy prior to chemo. If there is partial radiographic response to chemotherapy and tumor marker levels are normal, then surgical resection of all residual masses is recommended. Further management for patients who experience a partial radiographic response to chemotherapy with abnormal tumor marker levels is guided by the kinetics of the tumor markers. If tumor marker levels are elevated and persistently rising, the NCCN panel recommends a full course of second-line chemotherapy with close surveillance. So patients who have incomplete response to chemotherapy require more frequent imaging that is outlined in the table. Patient who, uh, patients who undergo RPLND are found to have N0 disease 
and are found to have N0 disease or N1 pure teratoma need only one CT scan at post-op month um, three to four and then as clinically indicated. So chest CT scan with contrast is preferred in patients with thoracic symptoms. So second line therapy options for patients with early relapses include enrollment in a clinical trial, which is the preferred, um, preferred uh, mode of treatment. Um, they can also undergo conventional dose chemotherapy or high dose, high dose chemotherapy. If chemotherapy is given, either conventional dose and high dose regimens are preferred. So the conventional dose regimens are TIP or VEIP. So TIP is paclitaxel, iphosphamide, cisplatin, and VEIP is vinblastin, iphosphamide, and cisplatin. The high dose regimens include high dose carboplatin plus etoposide, followed by autologous stem cell transplant or paclitaxel plus iphosphamide followed by high-dose carboplatin plus etoposide with stem cell support. So late relapses occur in 2-3% to of testicular cancer survivors. The NCCN panel prefers surgical salvage for these patients if the current, recurrent mass is resectable. If unresectable, chemotherapy is the preferred option. So um, patients with a complete response to second-line therapy with normal marker levels should put under surveillance. So alternatively, um, some patients may receive um, nerve sparing bilateral RPLND with a Category 2B recommendation followed by surveillance. For patients with a partial response to second-line therapy, um, which is indicated by residual mass on CT scan and normal marker levels, Surgical resection of all residual masses is recommended, followed by surveillance. However, two more marker levels are elevated and persistently rising. The NCCN panel recommends the third-line therapy. So, um, participation in a clinical trial is the preferred treatment option for patients who experience relapse following first and second-line therapy. So in order to maintain optimal efficiency and limit treatment-related toxicities, the chemotherapy regimens previously received by the patient should be considered when deciding on third-line therapy options. So the recommended third-line palliative chemotherapy options for patients with intensively pretreated, cisplatin-resistant, or refractory GCTs are combinations of gemcitabine with paclitaxel and or oxaliplatin or oral etoposide. So pembrolizumab, um, an anti-PD-1 antibody was approved by the FDA for the treatment of patients with unresectable or metastatic solid tumors that have progressed following prior treatment and who have no satisfactory alternative treatment option. So lastly, um, treatment of um, brain metastasis. So the um, brain metastases are relatively rare and occur almost exclusively in patients with non-seminoma histology. The optimal management of brain metastasis for testicular GCT is controversial with lack of evidence from trials to guide treatment decisions. Uh, currently, they recommend primarily cisplatin-based chemotherapy for patients with brain metastasis. Um, the addition of RT to chemotherapy regimen can also be considered. So surgical resection of metastatic brain lesions should be performed if clinically indicated and feasible. So next, we move on to the NCCN. Yes, sir. Yeah. So what are your key points to testicular cancer uh, based on uh, biopsy and staging? I mentioned what I mentioned. So you mentioned, Daryl, that there's no room for biopsy and also to stage the patient, it's always after radical uh, orchectomy. So yun yung importance sa testicular cancer. So you don't do biopsy. Actually, you also don't do uh, testis sparing surgery unless uh, unless your your suspicion is uh, non-cancer. So you can do that. Pero ang importance sa testicular cancer is you stage after orchectomy. And also, hindi mo masyado na mention yung imaging after orchectomy. Uh, although yung important yun, and yung zero markers. And also, you keep mentioning BEP and EP. So, when do we choose which? Uh, sir, ang sabi nung guidelines, 
BEP and EP are um, interchangeable. You can choose either one. But you, um, yung bleomycin kasi, sir, um, they have, uh, it is um, controlled. Administration of bleomycin is controlled in patients with um, creatinine clearance less than 30. Uh, that's not a Actually, what I'm looking for. Uh, bakit sa high stage, sa mga high advanced metastatic, why don't you give uh, bleomycin? But mansin mo EP lang or VIP? So what are the profile of uh, bleomycin? That's the reason why you can't give it sa advanced. Kung peculiar sa bleomycin. Kasi yung creatinine clearance actually more on the P yun eh. Yung, yun sa platinum base or cisplatin. But for bleomycin, ano bang profile niya? Why don't we give this to anybody? Why don't we give this to advanced metastatic? Hindi ba na-mention yun? Hindi mo na-encounter yun? Hindi ko na basa yun, sir. Hindi nakasulat sa guide. The profile of, uh, the problem with bleomycin, lalo na sa mga advanced, yung pulmonary fibrosis. So, yun yung problem niya. So, kunwari, may siguro smoker, so you can't give that kasi may merong chance na magka-pulmonary fibrosis. That's why it's not given with advanced cancers. So, yun yung tandaan nyo doon. And also, hindi mo na-mention pero nasa slide mo. Regarding teratoma, why do you think surveillance lang yung nandun kahit advanced? What's the problem with teratoma? Bakit surgery lang yung treatment niya? Uh, so, usually, um, teratomas um hindi siya nag-spread gaano and hindi siya tinatamaan ng chemotherapy not really nag-spread siya ang hinahanap ko lang word is resistant it's radio resistant it's RT resistant and it's chemo resistant so that, those are the key points i think at your level dahil yung mga basics then syempre ako sa memorize na lang yung follow up niya but for your level Yun, yung mga basics. Kung bakit, there must be a reason bakit ganyan yung NCCM guide. So, yun yun. Yung sa bleomycin, pulmonary fibrosis. Then, uh, sa teratoma, yun nga. Uh, chemo, RT resistant. Uh, mahaba ba tong kidney cancer? Uh, hindi, sir. Mas may exit. Sige. Tapos, if ever, ano, late, yung sa Wednesday na lang si... Ay, di. Si Glennis na lang muna. Ikaw na lang. Kasi ano siya eh. Duty siya next week eh. So, hindi siya makaka-report. Next week na lang tong kidney cancer. May kli lang naman yun eh. Yung prostate muna tayo. Yung non, uh, non-oncologic uh, benign prostate muna tayo ng AUA. Thank you, Daryl. Ganda rin. Yeah. is a histologic disc that refers to the proliferation of smooth muscle and epithelial cells within the prostatic transition zone. The exact etiology is unknown. However, the similarity between BPH and the embryonic morphogenesis of the prostate has led to the hypothesis that BPH may result from a reawakening in adulthood of the embryonic induction processes. The enlarged gland has been proposed to contribute to the overall lower urinary tract symptoms complex via at least two routes. Direct bladder outlet obstruction from enlarged tissue, which is the static component, and from increased smooth muscle tone and resistance within the enlarged gland, which is the dynamic component. Voiding symptoms have often been attributed to the physical presence of BOO. Detrusor overactivity is thought to be a contributor to the storage symptoms. Although lower urinary tract symptoms secondary to BPH is not often a life-threatening condition, the impact of Lutz BPH on quality of life can be significant and should not be underestimated. When the effect of BPH-associated lutes on quality of life was studied in a number of community-based populations, for many, the most important motivations for seeking treatment were the severity 
and the degree of bother associated with the symptoms. These were also important considerations when assessing BPH and deciding when treatment is indicated. Traditionally, the primary goal of treatment has been to alleviate bothersome lutes that result from prostatic enlargement. But more recently, treatment has additionally been focused on the alteration of disease progression and prevention of complications associated with BPH. So now let's define the terms. Uh, LUTs include storage or voiding disturbances common in aging men. Storage symptoms are experienced during the storage phase of the bladder and include daytime frequency and nocturia. Voiding symptoms, on the other hand, are experienced during the vo voiding phase. LUTs may be due to structural or functional abnormalities in one or more parts of the lower urinary tract that comprises the bladder, bladder neck, prostate, distal sphincter mechanism, and urethra. Abilities of peripheral or central nervous systems, neural control to the lower urinary tract. It may also be secondary to cardio. Survey uh, in men enlargement of the prostate gland from hyperplasia can cause BOO and be major cause and be a major cause of lutes or mimicked by other issues such as infection, malignancy, central peripheral neurologic disease, or overactivity, hypoactivity of the detrusor muscles. It is becoming widely accepted that the symptoms we relate in many old, older males may not have an etiology in prostate enlargement. Hence, uh, the term lutes independent of BPH has been introduced. While um, lutes secondary to BPH is still meaningful to clinicians, less frequently it has been associated with other comorbidities including acute urinary retention, renal insufficiency, uh, development of gross hematuria, bladder calculi, urinary incontinence, and recurrent urinary tract infection. The overactive bladder syndrome is defined as urgency with or without urge incontinence, usually with frequency and nocturia. The trusor overactivity is a urodynamic observation characterized by involuntary detrusor contractions during the filling phase. So it can either be spontaneous or provoked. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, as mentioned, is reserved for the histological pattern it describes. Benign prostate prostatic enlargement is used when there is gland enlargement and it will be based on the size of the prostate. Benign prostatic obstruction is used when obstruction has been proven by pressure flow studies or is highly suspected from flow rates and if the gland is enlarged. Bladder outlet obstruction is the generic term for all forms of obstruction to the bladder outlet, including BPO. So the AUA symptom index and the IPSS, I think you might be familiar with them, are self um, are nearly they are they are nearly identical, validated, short self-administered questionnaires that are used to assess the severity of three storage symptoms, which are frequency, nocturia, urgency, and four avoiding symptoms, which are weak strain intermittency, straining, and feeling of incomplete emptying. So this is the AUA uh, SI questionnaire. And then the next is, this is just to show that there is a Filipino, a Tagalog version of the IPSS, but What's different is if you look at the, the one on the right, the quality of life due to urinary symptoms is what differentiates it from the AUASI. So uh, 
this is the speci the specific quality of life, or the it's also called the bother score, which is scored from zero to six points. Basically, it asks if you were to spend the rest of your life with your urinary condition just the way it is now, how would you feel about that? Another is the BPH impact index, which is a questionnaire that assesses the effect of symptoms on everyday life and their interf interference with daily activities, thus capturing the impact of the condition. This questionnaire can be administered in conjunction with the AUASI and provides useful additional information to the single quality of life question. Uh, I would like to discuss this because uh, along the way through, uh, through this presentation, you will be seeing these, um, these terms. So the guideline statements were drafted by the panel based on the outcomes data and were tempered by the panel's expert opinion. So the statements were graded using three levels with respect to the degree of flexibility in their application. So a standard uh, has, the has the least flexibility as a treatment policy. A guideline statement is a standard if the health outcomes of the alternative interventions are sufficiently well known to permit meaningful decisions and there is a virtual unanimity about which intervention is preferred. A recommendation, on the other hand, has significantly more flexibility. A guideline statement is a recommendation if the health outcomes of the alternative intervention are sufficiently well known to permit meaningful decisions and an appreciable but not unanimous majority agrees on which intervention is preferred. While an option is even more flexible, a guideline statement is an option if the health outcomes of the interventions are not sufficiently well known to permit meaningful decisions or preferences are unknown or equivocal. Options can exist because of either of insufficient evidence or because patient preferences are divided and may influence choices made. So there are two uh, treatment algorithms that were adapted for, the, for this guideline that we're discussing. One is on the basic management of lutes in men, and the other is uh, on the detailed management for persistent bothersome lutes. So let's start with the basic management. Uh, we begin with the diagnostic evaluation or the recommended tests. The medical history should focus on the nature and duration of lutes, sexual function, general health issues, including fitness for invasive procedures, current medications, and prior surgical procedures that could affect lutes. The AUASI quality of life question validated quantitative assessment tools to evaluate symptoms and bother. A focused physical examination should be performed to assess the suprapubic area for bladder distension and motor and sensory function of the perineum and lower limbs. A DRE should be performed to evaluate anal sphincter tone and the prostate gland with regard to approximate size, consistency, shape, and abnormalities suggestive of, of prostate cancer. The DRE estimation of prostate volume has been shown to be inaccurate when compared to transrectal ultrasound. The volumes of small prostates tend to be overestimated and those of large glands tend to be underestimated. So training with a dedicated model has shown to improve the accuracy of DRE. Urine should be analyzed using any of the widely available dipstick tests to determine if the patient has hematuria, proteinuria, pyuria, or other pathological findings such as glucosuria, ketonuria, and a positive nitrite test. Examination of the urinary sediment and culture is indicated if the results of the dipstick are abnormal. The results of urinalysis may guide additional testing independent of the evaluation for loops. 
As an alternative way of estimating prostate size, serum PSA, prostate-specific antigen, may be utilized, particularly when the key question is whether the prostate is greater or less than a threshold volume. For example, to achieve a specificity of 70% while maintaining a sensitivity between 65 and 70%, approximate age-specific criteria for detecting men with prostate glands exceeding 40 ml have been found to be PSA level of greater than 1.6 nanogram per ml for men with BPH in their 50s, PSA level of greater than 2 nanogram per ml for men with BPH in their 60s, PSA levels greater than 2.3 nanogram per ml for men with BPH in their 70s. The benefits and risks of using serum PSA testing to diagnose prostate cancer should be discussed with the patient the possibilities of false positive and false negative results, the complications of subsequent truth guided biopsy, and false negative biopsies. So last on the list is the frequency volume chart. Uh, they are used when nocturia is the dominant symptom, but it may also be used in other settings. The time and the voided volume are recorded for each micturition during several 24-hour periods, and they help to identify patients with either isolated noctur nocturnal polyuria or excessive fluid intake, which are common in the aging male. So this is going back to the uh, main diagram. Let's start with uh, the one on the left. When initial evaluation demonstrates the presence of lutes only, with or without some degree of non-suspicious prostate enlargement, if the symptoms are not significantly bothersome, or if the patient does not want treatment, no further evaluation is recommended. The patient should be reassured and can be seen again if necessary. This recommendation is based on the opinion that patients with non-bothersome lutes are unlikely to experience significant health problems in the future due to their condition. On the other hand, in patients with bothersome symptoms, it is now recognized that lutes has a number of causes that may occur singly or in combination. Among the most important are BPO, overactive bladder, and nocturnal polyuria. The physician can discuss with the patient treatment alternatives based on the results of the initial evaluation with no further tests being needed. There should be discussion of the benefits and risks involved with each of the recommended treatment alternatives, which we will discuss later. Uh, and then the choice of treatment is reached process and show in the patient. Sorry, let's start with this uh, yellow triangle over here. If the patient has predominant significant nocturia and is awakened two or more times per night to void, it is recommended that the patient completes a frequency volume chart for two to three days. The frequency volume chart will show 24-hour polyuria or nocturnal polyuria when present. The first of which has been defined as greater than 3 liters total output over 24 hours. So in practice, patients with bothersome symptoms are advised to aim for a urine output of 1 liter per 24 hours. Nocturnal polyuria, on the other hand, is diagnosed when more than 33% of the 24-hour urine output occurs at night. It is managed uh, by reduction of fluid intake uh, or other treatments such as dismopressin can also be considered. If symptoms do not improve sufficiently, these patients can be managed similarly to those without predominant nocturia. So uh, let's go to, to this arm now. Um, if the patient has no polyuria 
and medical treatment is considered, the physician can proceed with therapy by focusing initially on modifiable fac factors such as concomitant drugs, regulation of fluid intake, especially in the evening, lifestyle, which is increasing activity for the patient, and diet, avoiding excess of alcohol and highly seasoned or irritative foods. Now, if pharmacological treatment is necessary, it is recommended that the patient be followed to assess treatment success and possible adverse events. The time from initiation of therapy to treatment assessment varies according to the pharmacological agent prescribed. An interval of two to four weeks is recommended for alpha blockers, while um, for five alpha reductase inhibitors, at least a three month interval is recommended. So if treatment is successful and the patient is satisfied, a once yearly follow-up should include a repeat of the initial evaluation. The follow-up strategy will allow the physician to detect any changes that have occurred, more specifically if symptoms have progressed or, ha or have become more bothersome, or if a complication has developed which requires surgery. So, um, we're done with lutes that cause little or no bother, with bothersome lutes. Now let's proceed to complicated lower urinary tract symptoms, which um, would be indicated by a suspicious DRE, hematuria, an abnormal PSA, pain, infection, a palpable bladder, or the presence of neurologic disease, or if uh, there is failure of standard treatment, we can proceed now to the detailed management for persistent bothersome loots after basic management. So the optional tests for uh, this algorithm, um, first is urinary flow rate measurement is optional. It is useful in the initial diagnostic assessment and during or after treatment to confirm the response. Despite the non-invasive nature of the test and its clinical value, it is an optional test in the detailed evaluation to be performed before embarking on any invasive therapy. Peak urinary flow or Qmax is the best single measure to estimate the probability of a patient to be urodynamically obstructed. But a low Qmax does not distinguish between obstruction and decreased detrusor contractility. Because of the intra-individual variability and the volume dependency of the Qmax, at least two flow rates should be obtained, ideally both with a volume greater than 150 ml voided urine. The determination of post-void residual urine is optional in the initial diagnostic assessment of the patient and during subsequent monitoring as a safety parameter. The determination is performed by non-invasive transabdominal ultrasonography. Because of the marked intra-individual variability of residual urine volume, the test should be repeated to improve precision, particularly if the first residual urine volume is significant and suggests a change in the treatment plan. Now, if there is evidence of BOO on uh, our evaluation. If drug therapy is considered, decisions will be influenced by coexisting overactive bladder symptoms and prostate size or serum PSA levels. If there are coexisting BOO and overactive bladder symptoms, so mixed OAB and BOO over here, the patient can be treated with combination of alpha blocker and anticholinergic therapy or anti-miscarinics. When BOO symptoms predominate, so that's uh, over here on the diagram, alpha adrenergic blocking agents are the first treatment of choice for Lutz due to DPH. Uh, however, a combination uh, alpha blockers alone, five ARIs alone, or combination alpha blocker and five ARI therapy have shown the most efficacy 
when the prostate is enlarged as assessed by PSA levels, transrectal ultrasound, or on the urine. As always, the decision for choice of therapy should be decided in concert with the patient's wishes and concerns. If storage symptoms predominate, so that's uh, in this part of the diagram, uh, an overactive bladder due to idiopathic detrusor overactivity is the most likely cause if there is no indication of BOO from flow study. The treatment options of lifestyle intervention, which includes fluid intake alteration, behavioral modification, and pharmacotherapy with anticholinergic drugs should be discussed with the patient. Um, it is the expert opinion of the panel that some patients may benefit using a combination of all three modalities mentioned. Should improvement be insufficient and symptoms severe, the newer modalities such as uh, botulinum toxin and sacral neuromodulation can be considered. The patient then should be followed to assess treatment success or failure and possible adverse events. So what if what if uh, these what if these treatments fail? If the patient elects interventional therapy and there is sufficient evidence of obstruction, the patient and urologist should discuss the benefits and risks of the various interventions. Transurethral resection is still the gold standard of interventional treatment, but when available, new interventional therapies could be discussed. If the patient's condition is not sufficiently suggestive of obstruction, so if the peak urinary flow or Qmax is greater than 10 ml per second, pressure flow studies are optional as treatment failure rates are somewhat higher in the absence of obstruction. So if interventional therapy is planned without clear evidence of the presence of obstruction, the patient has to be informed of possible higher failure rates of the procedure. Pressure flow studies, although invasive, are the only tests that directly measure the relative contribution of the bladder, bladder outlet, and prostate to, to lower urinary tract function, dysfunction, or lutes. They are not indicated in the routine evaluation of men with lutes or to predict the response to medical therapy, but it may be beneficial in cases in which Qmax is greater than 10 ml per second to determine the need for invasive ther therapy to relieve BOO. A pressure flow study is the only method with the potential to distinguish men with a low urinary flow rate, either due to detrusor underactivity, from those with a bladder outlet obstruction. This distinction is made by relating detrusor pressure at maximum urinary flow rate to the maximum flow rate. So information on the benefits and harms of treatment alternatives for lute secondary to BPH should be explained to patients with moderate to severe symptoms for AUI, SI, that would be a score greater than or equal to A, who are bothered enough to consider therapy. So these are the treatment alternatives. Watchful waiting or active uh, surveillance, it is a management strategy in which the patient is monitored by his physician, but currently receives no active intervention for BPH. The level of symptom distress that individual patients are able to tolerate is highly variable. So watchful waiting may be a patient's treatment of choice, even if he has a high AUISI score. So that is again emphasizing the, the importance of knowing how bothered the patient is with his symptoms. Symptom distress may be reduced with simple measures such as avoiding decongestants or antihistamines, decreasing fluid intake at bedtime, and decreasing caffeine and alcohol intake generally. Uh, watchful waiting patients usually are re-examined yearly, repeating the initial evaluation as previously discussed. Uh, 
As prostate volume assessed by DRE or serum PSA predicts the natural history of symptoms, flow rate, and risk for AUR and surgery, patients may be advised depending on the outcomes of these assessments as to in their individual risks. Measures to reduce the risk, such as medical intervention, may be offered depending on the circumstances. So we discuss the medical therapies next. Um, first is alpha adrenergic blockers. Uh, Alfuzosin, doxazosin, tamsulosin, and terazosin are appropriate and effective treatment alternatives for patients with bothersome, moderate to severe loot secondary to BPH. Although there are slight differences in the adverse events pro profiles of these agents, all four appear to have equal clinical effectiveness. The older, less costly, generic alpha blockers, which are doxazosin and terazosin, remain reasonable choices, but they require dose titration and blood pressure monitoring. Of note, ejaculatory dysfunction has been reported less frequently with alfuzosin. So the combination of an alpha blocker and uh, 5 ARI therapy is an appropriate and effective treatment for patients with LUTs associated with demonstrable prostatic enlargement based on volume measurement, PSA level, or enlargement on DRE, which was mentioned a while ago. Men with LUTs secondary to BPH for whom alpha blocker therapy is offered must be asked about planned cataract surgery. Men with planned cataract surgery should avoid the initiation of alpha blockers until their cataract surgery is completed. The intraoperative floppy iris syndrome, or IFIS, was first described by Chang and Campbell in 2005. In 2005 as a triad of progressive intraoperative meiosis despite preoperative dilation, a billowing of a flaccid iris, and iris prolapse toward the incision site during phacoemulsification for cataracts. Operative complications in some cases included posterior capsule rupture with vitreous loss and post-operative intraocular pressure spikes, though visual acuity outcomes appeared uh, preserved. The original report linked this condition with the preoperative use of tamsulosin uh, iris dilator smooth muscle inhibition has been suggested as a potential mechanism. Review of data showed that the risk was substantial among men taking tamsulosin. The risk appears to be lower with older generic alpha blockers such as terazosin and doxazosin. The dose or duration that influences risk of IFIS is unclear whether stopping alpha blocker treatment at any time before surgery mitigates risk of IFIS is unclear. Inhibitors, they may be used to prevent progression of food secondary to BPH and to reduce the risk of urinary retention and future prostate-related surgery. They should not be used in men with glute secondary to BPH without prostatic enlargement. They are appropriate and effective treatment alternatives for men with glute secondary to BPH who have demonstrable prostate enlargement. So the ones we use are finasteride and tetasteride. To compare them, the dosing for finasteride is 5 milligrams. Uh, once a day as compared to the 0.5 milligrams day, once a day for the tasteride. Finasteride inhibits uh, the receptor, the type 2 ISO enzyme, while the tasteride inhibits both type 1 and type 2. However, in the prostate and specifically in BPH tissues, type 2 5 alpha reductase is far more common than type 1. Finasteride reduces serum 70% uh, of serum levels of DHT, while the tasteride uh, reduces it by 95%. The serum half-life of finasteride is six to eight hours, while it's at, it's fi at five weeks for the tasteride. 
five alpha reductase inhibitors may be used for other indications. For hematuria, uh, finasteride is an, is an appropriate and effective treatment alternative in men with prostatic, uh, with refractory hematuria, presumably due to prostatic bleeding. So other causes of hematuria must be ex excluded first. One of the early interprostatic effects of finasteride has been the suppression of vascular endothelial growth factor. In men with prostate-related bleeding, uh, they responded to finasteride therapy with a reduction or cessation of such bleeding and a reduced likelihood of recurrent bleeding. So based on the effect of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors on prostate-related bleeding, several investigators studied the effect of pre-surgical treatment with a 5-ARI on bleeding during TURP. Overall, there is insufficient evidence to recommend using 5-ARI preoperatively in the setting of a scheduled TURP to reduce intraoperative bleeding or reduce the need for blood transfusions. Next class is the uh, anticholinergic agents or anti-muscarinic agents. They block the neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the central and peripheral nervous system. This class of medication reduces the effects mediated by acetylcholine on its receptors in bladder neurons through competitive inhibition. So it is the M3 receptors that are primarily responsible for bladder contraction. Anticholinergic agents are appropriate and effective treatment alternatives for the management of lute secondary to BPH in men without an elevated post-void residual and when lutes are predominantly irritative. Prior to initiation of anticholinergic therapy, baseline post-void residual urine should be assessed. Anticholinergic should be used with caution in patients with a PVR greater than 250 to 300 CC. For complementary and alternative medicines, there are, there's no dietary supplement, combination phytotherapeutic agent, or other non-conventional therapy recommended for management of lute secondary to BPH. Available data do not suggest that saw palmetto, which is this plant, has a clinically meaningful effect on lute secondary to BPH. The paucity of published high-quality single extract clinical trials of Ortica dioica do not provide a sufficient evidence base with which to recommend for, for or against its use for the treatment, treatment of lute secondary to BPH. So minimally invasive therapies can also be uh, offered. Safety recommendations for the use of transurethral needle ablation of the prostate, also known as called tuna microwave thermotherapy, published by the US FDA, must be followed. Tuna is safe with low perioperative complications such as bleeding and has a low to non-existent rate of associated erectile dysfunction for which this therapy is attractive. Tuna of prostate is an appropriate and effective treatment alternative for bothersome moderate to severe or severe lute secondary to BPH. Transurethral microwave thermotherapy, on the other hand, heats the prostate using a microwave antenna mounted on a urethral catheter. This interventional therapy is effective in partially relieving the symptoms and bother believed secondary to BPH. It is the least operator dependent of the BPH interventions and predicting responders is difficult and inconsistent. So surgical procedures may be done to, for uh, may be offered to patients with moderate to severe lower urinary tract symptoms, and for patients who have developed acute urinary retention and other BPH-related complications. 
it is the most invasive, op invasive option for BPH management, and generally, patients will have failed medical therapy before proceeding with surgery. But medical therapy may not be viewed as a requirement because some patients may wish to pursue the most effective therapy as a primary treatment if their symptoms are particularly bothersome. Surgery is recommended for patients who have renal insufficiency secondary to BPH, for those who have recurrent UTIs, bladder, a presence of bladder stones or gross hematuria due to BPH, and those who have lutes refractory to other therapies. The presence of a bladder diverticulum is not an absolute indication for surgery unless associated with recurrent UTI or progressive bladder dysfunction. Open prostatectomy involves the surgical removal or enucleation of the inner portion of the prostate, either via a suprapubic or retropubic incision in the lower abdominal area. It is typically performed on patients with prostate volumes greater than 80 to 100 ml. There, although there is a significant risk of blood loss, transfusion, and a longer hospital stay associated with open prostatectomy when compared to TURP. So open prostatectomies may be needed only for men with very enlarged prostate glands um, because it may be more effective than TURP in relieving the blockage of urine flow and for men with bladder diverticula or stones. Laser therapies, um, so as with all new devices, comparison of outcomes between studies should be considered cautiously given the rapid evolution in technologies and power levels. Emerging evidence suggests a possible role of transurethral enucleation and laser vaporization as options for men with very large prostates. So if it's greater than 100 grams. In general, laser energy can be used to produce a variety of effects within prostate tissue, including coagulation necrosis or vaporization or resection of tissue. Transurethral holmium laser ablation of the prostate. Um, a holmium YAG laser may be used to treat prostatic tissue transurethrally using a 550 micron side firing laser fiber in a non-contact mode. It delivers laser energy at a wavelength of 2,120 nanometers infrared range, which is absorbed primarily by water and results in an optical penetration depth of 0.4 millimeters. It is intended to be comparable to TURP in that the prostatic lobes may be vaporized down to the surgical capsule resulting in a TURP-like effect. So an ablation um, you could be being ablated or evaporated. So there is no prostate tissue that is available to be removed for evaluation by a pathologist. Transurethral holmium laser enucleation of the prostate, on the other hand, there is a tissue that will be removed and can be evaluated for a histopath. The holmium laser has been used to inoc in inoc inoc enucleate the prostate adenoma, separating the adenoma from surgical capsule from apex to base after any median lobe has been freed from the bladder neck. It can be utilized for larger glands that previously would have been treated surgically with an open prostatectomy. Results compare favorably to open prostatectomy in the hands of an experienced surgeon. In other trials, improvements in symptom score, quality of life indices, and flow rate, flow rate approach those obtained after TURP. The learning curve for holmium laser enucleation of the prostate appears to be greater than that of other technologies. Operative times for holmium enucleation has, have been improved significantly with the advent of the tissue morcellator. 
So by morselating the tissue within the bladder, the resection technique can be modified to allow complete enucleation of the median and lateral lobes of the prostate. During the initial experience with HOLAP, as I mentioned a while ago, it became evident that using the incisional properties of the high-powered holmium laser and resecting the tissue piecemeal would improve the efficiency of the procedure. So this is how uh, holmium laser resection of the prostate came to be. Uh, this procedure was termed uh, HOLERP and fragments of less than two grams are produced and removed from the bladder by manual irrigation. A custom-made retrieval loop was used to remove larger tissue fragments from the bladder once the resection was complete down to the surgical capsule. One of the benefits of this procedure is that tissue is available for histological examination. So this is associated with a slightly reduced risk of bleeding, reduced need for blood transfusion, and an, abs and an absence of transurethral resection syndrome. Photoselective vaporization of the prostate is another option. Uh, it uses 600 micron side firing fiber in a non-contact mode. The primary difference from HOLAP is its wavelength of 532 nanometers in the green visible spectrum which is absorbed by both the water irrigation and hemoglobin, resulting in an optical penetration, penetration depth of 0.8 millimeters. Other acronyms for this procedure, KTP and LBO, identify the crystal used in the laser generator. This is performed using normal saline irrigation and a continuous flow scope. Uh, the goal of PVP is to create a TURP-like cavity after ablating the various prostatic lobes down to the surgical capsule. Symptom score improved consistently in all studies, as did quality of life scores and maximum urinary flow rates. Transurethral incision of the prostate is an outpatient endoscopic surgical procedure limited to the treatment of smaller prostates. So 30 ml of resected weight or less. In the TUIP procedure, one or two cuts are made in the prostate and the prostate capsule, reducing constriction of the urethra. It results in degrees of symptomatic improvement equivalent to those attained after TURP. Uh, compared to TURP, incision of the prostate results in significantly reduced risk of ejaculatory disturbance. But it is uh, associated with slightly higher rate of secondary procedures. You see you didn't really remove any tissue. Uh, Transurethral electro vaporization of the, of the prostate. Um, this was first described by Bush in 1993, who used a grooved cur uh, ball electrode. So something like this, current to sculpt out the prostatic bed. And they claimed advantages of little or no bleeding, fluid absorption, or electrolyte imbalance. So it can be used uh, for those with moderate to severe loops who are significantly bothered by these symptoms. Uh, compared to TURP, transurethral electrovaporization results in equivalent short-term improvements in symptom scores, urinary flow rate, and quality of life indices. And there is a decreased risk of the perioperative complication of transurethral resection syndrome compared with traditional monopolar TURP. The rates of post-operative irritative voiding symptoms, dysuria, and urinary retention, as well, for the, as well as the need for unplanned secondary catheterization, appears to be higher for TUVP. So reoperation rates are higher uh, compared to TURP. Long-term comparative trials are needed to determine if the transurethral electrovaporization approach is superior to standard TURP.
So transurethral resection of the prostate involves the surgical removal of the prostate's inner portion via an endoscopic approach through the urethra with no external skin incision. Historically, this procedure was the most common active treatment for symptomatic BPH, but potential morbidities, the desire to shorten catheter dwell time, and pressure to reduce hospital length of stay have stimulated the development of alternative procedures. This is usually performed under general or spinal anesthesia, so it requires hospital stay. One unique complication of the URP is the TUR syndrome, which is a dilutional hyponatremia that occurs when irrigant solution is absorbed into the bloodstream. Other complications that have been reported in more than 5% of patients include <clears throat> erectile dysfunction, irritative voiding symptoms, bladder neck contracture, the need for blood transfusion, UTI, and hematuria. Bipolar resection of the prostate utilizes a special resectoscope loop that incorporates both the active and the return electrodes. This design limits the dispersal of the current flow in the body, which theoretically reduces the deleterious effects of the stray current flow. The bipolar loop can be used to resect tissue as well as to coagulate, vaporize, and transect tissue. So because the bipolar resectoscope using point nine, uh, plain NSS as irrigation fluid, the risk of TUR syndrome is eliminated. Laparoscopic and robotic prostatectomies are techniques currently associated with the treatment of prostate cancer, but the single cohort study has reported on consecutive patients undergoing laparoscopic simple prostatectomy for the treatment of flutes. Uh, the operation can take three to five hours, which is longer than traditional surgery. So men with moderate... Lenis? Lenis? Yes, sir. Lenis, I can stop. Can I stop you right there? It's a radical prosta. I'll just su summarize. Mukhang mm -hmm. na-cover mo lahat. Ah, last yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Sorry, sige. Finish it na. Uh, so, this is the separate uh, diagram for surgical management, although we've already mentioned them. So, uh, what we co what is considered is basically the size of the prostate, kung alin yung mas appropriate. And these are the uh, directions for future research for BPH. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Lenis, uh, for that lecture. Just to summarize, since uh, we're going to be able to So when you see a patient complaining of uh, lower urinary tract symptoms, so make sure to get the age, PSS, and your DRE. And depending on any mga prerequisite, important yung voiding diary. Regardless, actually, sabi kasi dun sa guidelines for uh, or uh, nocturial, nocturnal, nocturnal symptoms lang. But we highly advise you to do the uh, for uh, age. So you screen with you screen prostate cancers for patients above 45 years old to 75 years old. So in, benign prostatic kasi ito eh. Pero pagkasama yung guidelines ng prostate cancer. So you screen at 45 years old to 75 years old depending on the quality of life. Pag yung patients nyo African-American, you can start by 40 or depending on the risk. And then yung lagi namin tanong sa mga interns, yung indications for TURP. So I think that was mentioned naman. Actually, hindi siya actually indications for TURP. Uh, intervention siya for... Uh, Indication siya for an intervention. So in that case, so to summarize na lang mabilis, uh, Glenn, your indications for intervention. Um, so recurrent UTI, hematuria, uh, bladder calculi, a refractory to uh, medical management. Ilan ako? Diver uh, naka five again. Divertical, uh, refractory medications, trial without catheter, tapos azotemia. So, I apologize, I underestimate, I 
uh, I underestimated the time. So uh, let's just take an attendance. And uh, and I'll see you Wednesday. Attendance now. Wow. Okay.